This video will demonstrate why using broadband impulse responses for aligning mains to subs is ill-advised. Because for subwoofers, compared to full range loudspeakers, little to no amplitude will be left over, and the delay finders built into our analyzers tend to favor in-band frequencies rather than the crossover frequency span. But most important of all, always use the same measurement synchronization delay to evaluate whether or not frequency crossovers are properly phase aligned. Here is a conceptual diagram of an imaginary setup featuring two loudspeakers, each separated by a 10 millisecond long air gap from the same measurement microphone. At room temperature, the 10 millisecond long propagation time to cross such an air gap corresponds with a distance of roughly 3.44 meters or 11.3 feet. The red loudspeaker represents a full range loudspeaker, whereas the green loudspeaker represents a band limited subwoofer. The complete system in this example is phase aligned off the bat as long as the loudspeaker grills are coplanar. Let's use a dual channel transfer function analyzer to observe these loudspeakers' impulse responses. Starting with the full range loudspeaker without synchronizing measurement and reference signals, we can confirm that the loudspeaker's response to an impulse is indeed late by 10 milliseconds worth of airborne propagation time, in accordance with the physical air gap between loudspeaker and measurement microphone. If we switch to the subwoofer, all things being equal and once more without synchronizing measurement and reference signals, there's nothing to see. Even though the subwoofer lives at the same physical distance and subsequent flight time to the measurement microphone as the full range loudspeaker, what could be going on? The amplitude of an impulse response is proportional to the ratio of the information received by the analyzer with respect to the information transmitted by the analyzer. Assuming a sample rate of 48 kilohertz, when 24,000 hertz's worth of pink noise is injected into the full range loudspeaker, pretty much all of them are returned. As such, the impulse response's amplitude suffers from little to no attenuation. However, when the same 24,000 hertz's worth of pink noise is injected into the subwoofer, less than 1% of all available information is returned and as such, the amplitude of its impulse response is expected to cave by at least 99.5% on a linear scale or 48 decibels on a logarithmic scale. In order to see what's left over of the subwoofer's linear impulse response, we need to zoom in along the vertical amplitude axis by at least a factor of 100. Once zoomed in, we can see the remaining impulse response. Apart from the significant drop in amplitude caused by the subwoofer's band limiting behavior, the corresponding phase shift has stretched out the remainder over dozens of milliseconds. Subsequently, to me, a subwoofer's impulse response always resembles a snake, whose head signifies the arrival time of the highest frequencies still being passed by the subwoofer. The remaining frequencies are dispersed and arrive progressively later with decreasing frequency. In other words, where the impulse response starts to oscillate and stray from zero amplitude is where our snake steers its head and the first subwoofer frequencies arrive. Notice that the snake's head is late by the same 10 milliseconds of airborne propagation time as the full range loudspeaker. Let's see whether or not an analyzer can validate these observations. If we instruct the analyzer to determine the time offset between measurement and reference signals by virtue of a delay finder, for the full range loudspeaker we get the expected answer, 10 milliseconds, in perfect agreement with the propagation time associated with the physical air gap between loudspeaker and measurement microphone. However, if we repeat the exercise for the subwoofer, despite our previous knowledge of the arrival of the snake's head, the delay finder suggests 22.88 milliseconds rather than 10 milliseconds. Notice that the delay finder simply locks on to the tallest amplitude value, regardless whether it's positive or negative. When one judges a book by its cover, one may be led to believe that the subwoofer is lagging by 12.88 milliseconds with respect to the full range loudspeaker and may be inclined to delay the latter accordingly such that both loudspeakers impulse responses match. 
Whether this practice results in a successful crossover alignment or not remains to be seen. Here one sees the outcome of time aligning passbands, not to be mistaken for full range loudspeakers, using their impulse responses. The yellow trace, which represents the sum of both loudspeakers, clearly shows destructive interference where level is lost throughout crossover, rather than gained or preserved. Something typically frowned upon by members of the SPL Preservation Society. For the frequency range where it mattered most, prior to level isolation coming to the rescue, allowing for misalignment, both loudspeakers' phase responses have mismatched slopes and do not overlap the very conditions that need to be met for a successful phase-aligned crossover. Since this entire demonstration relies on a complete loudspeaker system that is already phase-aligned as long as the grills are coplanar, let's ignore the recommendation for the subwoofer by the analyzer's delay finder and manually override it with the same value as found for the full-range loudspeaker. After all, both loudspeakers in this example live at the same physical distance to the measurement microphone. Notice that both loudspeakers' phase responses, when evaluated with the same synchronization delay, exhibit matching slopes that overlap for the frequency range of interest prior to level isolation coming to the rescue, allowing for misalignment. As one can see, this entire loudspeaker system is indeed phase aligned right off the bat with no signs of destructive interference throughout crossover. If one insists on using a delay finder to time align passbands, not to be mistaken for full range loudspeakers, one should confine both loudspeakers joint custody to the same frequency span. This analyzer allows users to single out one octave rather than the entire audible band and look at its impulse response whereby effectively turning an impulse response into an octave-wide wavelet response. When one solely evaluates the octave centered at the crossover frequency, in these examples 100 Hz, the remaining peaks are offset by 2.4 milliseconds rather than 12.88 milliseconds, as suggested when all frequencies were considered during the first trial. Let's see whether or not delaying the full range loudspeaker by 2.4 milliseconds provides the desired outcome. Having already seen the correct result during the second trial, it should not come as a surprise that this phase alignment, while being close, is still not optimal. That being said, confining impulse responses to the joint custody between two pass bands will at least get you into the ballpark unlike when all frequencies were considered as shown during the first trial. That's it. These conclude the reasons why it is ill-advised to use broadband impulse responses to align mains to subs. For a complete and exhaustive recipe for subwoofer alignment, please consider reading my article called Subwoofer Alignment, the Foolproof Relative Absolute Method. For a more in-depth explanation of how an impulse response's appearance changes with bandwidth and phase shift, please consider watching Why the Impulse Response Won't Work for Subwoofers. Thank you for watching.